Well, I've come for a very special reason, and actually to celebrate one of the finest oral historians in the British Isles, a man by the name of Eric Rad- Radcliffe Cregeen. His parents were both Manx, and I think it might have been always to his regret that he wasn't born on the Isle of Man because his father was a Methodist minister. And so that calling took him to Yorkshire, where Eric was born, and his sister and his brother. His sister actually is probably well known on the Isle of Man because she was a very, very fine archaeologist, Sheila Cregeen, and there's a Sheila Cregeen archive in the Manx Museum. But his path was slightly different. And he became an oral historian and a folklorist. And his passion for this was really um, out of the times he spent. I think every school holiday, he could hardly wait to get on the ferry, to go home. Interesting. Going home to the Isle of Man. His grandfather was the blacksmith at Peel, and he kept goats on the hill. And Eric, from about the age of 13, kept a diary. And you can hear the schoolboy voice of it. He and his brother with grandfather went up and fed the goats. And there's these delightful little images that childhood um, is full of wonders. But he never lost that sense of wonder his whole life. And he would sit and listen to his grandfather talking to the fisherman or whoever dropped by or somebody with a horse. And he would then write down what he heard and saw. And there was full of questions, of course. I think they were reasonably, um, well, I I speak as somebody, I'm an islander myself, I'm from the Isle of Skye, and even in my childhood in the 50s, although I'm a bit younger than he was, because he was born 1921, and I am a post-war baby, (laughs) we didn't have money to buy cameras and things like that, although my grandfather was a fisherman, but I remember hearing my grandfather talk about going into the herring ports on the west coast and all the way up the coast and talking about Iesgar as in Yelan Vanan, a fisherman from the Isle of Man. And in Scots Gaelic, it's very, very close to Manx. Um, for us is good night and for you as well. Gamaleshgal is excuse me. And very much the same uh, in Manx. So Eric, um, I think he felt that he was denied a birthright when he didn't speak the language. So he would listen and write down, and with the guidance of older speakers, he began to form a vocabulary until by the time he was in his late teens and he went to Cambridge. He still only had one ambition, was to come back and and, um, record as much as he could. What is it about his life that engages you particularly as a as a historian? Yes. Well, I would call myself a folklorist and oral historian as well. And I recognise in him a sort of fascination that I had growing up on the Isle of Skye, where in the world's eyes, we must have been completely impoverished. My mother was born in a thatched house with a mud floor, and I myself was seven before we had electricity. My grandparents' house had no plumbing except one tap until, gosh, I think I'd left home. I never saw television until I was 17. Now, that in itself might look as if um, it was what a deprived way, for goodness sake, especially in today's world where, you know, people are attached to all kinds of devices. But I remember talking to my mother about her childhood, which was even possibly more simple than mine. And she said these words, I had the most idyllic childhood. We had so many songs and stories and I never knew what the word bored meant. And my mother used to talk and everybody in the community, it was just the way of life. And I recognised that reading his diaries. I didn't find them by myself, I must tell you. In fact, Mrs. Cregeen, Eric's widow, got in touch with me because she'd read some of my own work as a folklorist and I spent pretty well my life as well recording oh all kinds of things not just rural life but you know industrial central Scotland miners and industrial workers but she knew I was interested and she said you know all those years since Eric died he was only 62 and in our house there's a box full of journals that he kept I'd hate to see it thrown out. And she, well, 
I don't suppose I took a lot of convincing, although I gasped when I saw them. There's over 4,000 pages of them. And I said, well, it would be dreadful if it, a loss to both areas, to the Isle of Man and to Scotland. He went to Scotland in 1956 after he'd, I would say, achieved great things here on the island. He, he was a volunteer first for the Manx Language Survey and he would spend hours listening, recording, because they introduced the tape recorder. And then he eventually became assistant curator of the Manx Museum. And during that time, he created a survey. Um, for example, let's say you were, you were kept sheep and you like spinning and weaving. Well, he would do a survey of that. What was your spinning wheel like? And what, how did you dye the wool? And where did these plants grow? And, and, and what did you make? And what about the fishermen's clothes? And what did they eat? All that. So that was the survey. And then in 1956, he'd had a little... We'd, after a break from this intense field work, he took a break in fifty six. He moved to Scotland where he thought he might rise to a new challenge, which he certainly did. And he began to do the same thing there, although he didn't have a job doing that. His job really was to set up um, lectures in these post-war years for people who'd missed out on a college education. They'd been soldiers or sailors. And they were going to come back and be, well, whatever they could be, miners, blacksmiths, fishermen. And so he created, on behalf of the University of Glasgow, a series of lectures where people might gather and feel that they were, they too were having access to a sort of more cultural education. A vocation is one thing, but we need more than just a day's work. And what happened then was he began to write down things about the people who came. One evening, a 90-year-old man came and he'd been a drover of cattle. He'd walked all the way from Campbelltown, that's where Paul McCartney lived, by the way, way down in the Mull of Kintyre, all the way, it's weeks of a walk, to the markets in Stirling and Falkirk, and he described to him what it was like to be a drover of cattle to sell the cattle, hundreds and hundreds of them, and then to walk all the way down to Smithfield in London, walk with cattle. And that all died out when the trains came in. So he said, I must go and record that man. He's the only one left. So that began in Scotland 30 years of the most amazing journals and tape recordings to go with them and photographs and sketches and it, it's just remarkable. So I think that um, you would have to be sort of oblivious to your own culture not to be excited by a project like this. But I had help, I have to say. Obviously, in your vocation or in your passion even, finding something like that is like gold dust. It's winning the lottery. But why is it so important that people do we re recognise these people that do record every little part of their lives. You use the word lottery and it's very serendipitous because when I looked at this, I said to Mrs Christian, oh, I need 10 lives to do this. And heritage lottery, people buy their tickets and they hope for something. It's nice to give back. So I thought if there are 10 people or 20 or even more who'd like to take part in this and who would be interested... Maybe Heritage Lottery would pay them and give one diary to you and so on and one to somebody else. And they could have it at home, earn a little bit of pocket money. Nobody gets rich. And then we'd have gatherings looking at the stuff. And we'd, well, Heritage Lottery said yes. So they offered a grant over 18 months to transcribe all this. And we're talking 40, no, 4,000 pages. But there was, it wasn't a catch, really. And I think you'd have to be either passionate about it or mad to take it on. But I decided I would. <laughs> and the catch, if it was that, was, ah, but you have to go to 10 of the places in which he recorded. And you have to find a community where he recorded and give this back to them particularly and show them how to do it in this generation. So in 10 places, um, I went 
uh, bringing this, the relevant pages, might be 40, 50 pages, saying, somebody's grandfather's here, and they were. And they'd get talking, let's record this, let's, and we did it in schools, we had an exhibition, and then the BBC did an hour-long documentary on the work, following some of these people and watching their excitement about finding this in the Crigene journals. And what turned up was just remarkable. So we had a big team. I would say in the end, there were maybe 40 people who worked on it. I had to do all the editing and trying to figure out the writing with them and because I'm from a very, well, a background where the the terminology for me is quite common. But for urban people, it would be, you know, like me trying to understand the insides of a computer, not a chance. So <laughs> they were never off the phone, Margaret, what's that? And what's Zooming and what's this and what's that? So that was good. Um, and then finally we had a big exhibition at the National Library in Edinburgh where a packed house came in to look at Crigine's work. And really, this visit to the Isle of Man is the last stage. It would really, there would be something terribly amiss if we didn't bring back the whole lot and and take it to the Manx Museum where he was once assistant curator and say, this is a gift from Scotland, a gift on behalf of a man to whom we know enorm- we owe enormous gratitude because he was such a gift to us quite emotional <laughs> it's, it's really lovely um, and, and of course so you you have a few things here in the studio uh, at the moment as well some examples yes. of letters blown up and yes. I mean perhaps you could just recall just a, a phrase or something just to yes, give an idea um, this is his diary 1939 so he would he would have been a uh, 19 no he would not <laughs> he was born in 21 so well yes that's right 18 um and he talks about his being at his grandfather's and, and the, he said they had a visitor by the name of Caesar Cashin. And he was telling Grandad that he hoped for rain on the 5th of July. There's an old saying in the Isle of Man that if you see a horseshoe print on the road full of rain at midsummer that day, and that was for them July the 5th. Isn't that interesting? That's the old calendar. Then there would be, it would be, it was good. And he also talked about the full moon, and he talked about um, the oh, it, 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 all these old customs about about um, Saint Bride's Day. So he just wrote it down as he heard it, and I'm holding up for you to see, but you can't see on the radio that the writing at that stage is quite boyish in a way. He went on; it got much scrawlier after that, and then. Oh, I have a photo of him. He's at Inverary Castle in Scotland because he realised that he would have to get into the archives to see the various documents relating. And I, I've got a collection of his essays. Um, he was really a remarkable writer as well as a remarkable uh, field worker. And if I might just quote Professor Smout, who's our most famous, he was he's the historiographer royal of Scotland, there's a title, <laughs> of St Andrews University. And this is what he said about Eric Crugine. Eric Crugine was a social scientist of the highest order. He was not only far in advance of his time, but no one since has put together the disciplines of history and anthropology so effectively as to illuminate the life of the Highlands of Scotland. So in a way, he would have. It, it can still be done for the Isle of Man using his journals because it's there. But other people have done a great job as well. And if this can excite them, uh, um, the book of his essays is quite varied, and it is almost all about Scotland. However, my other thing, um, this is volume ten of ten volumes, not quite a foot deep of paper, but this is what we're going to leave here. The index will tell you the kinds of things. Names of people, um, names of places, and uh, little phrases. And he, I should say, recorded about 300 and something songs as well, mostly in Gaelic. And the, the recordings are all housed in Edinburgh, although you can hear them online. You can hear them online. So if you find one you fancy listening to, you can just listen. Pipe tunes as well. 
So you'll be leaving something behind as well as oh, yes. a, 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 the lecture itself, so people can yes. go and visit that. Thing. Yes, and this will stay in the Manx Museum. It'll be in the reference section, and people can come and enjoy it. We've got extra copies of the index, so I actually quite, now, even although I was part of compiling this, I now have time to sit and look through the index, and I go, wow, he did that as well. <laughs> it's it's remarkable. He was remarkable. He deserves to be remembered. <laughs>